Um, our first review of the day is going to be for Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Um, here in this film, we have the returning uh, Ethan Hunt, Tom Cruise here who is on another mission, a mission that some people deem impossible, but he finds a way to do it. Um, here, he's going up against uh, one of his biggest enemies. Uh, never before seen have we seen uh, this big of a threat of uh, in the world, and this is, involves AI, um, AI, artificial intelligence. Um, nothing uh, we've seen this scary since Space Jam 2, Don Cheadle as Algae Rhythm. Have we seen uh, <laughs> AI, this kind of scary before? Um, so here... He's facing off against this, this unfeeling, uh, cold machine that is all about the ones and zeros uh, that has gone rogue um, and is up to him to kind of stop it. Uh, one of the people working for the AI is a character called Gabriel, who's played by uh, uh, Elise Morales, uh, who's here. And then uh, you also, of course, have the returning characters like Simon Pegg and Ben Rames, who's part of the uh, mission, uh, the IMF, the Impossible Mission Force team. Um, so, and, and people said that this movie is also kind of like somewhat of a meta commentary uh, for, you know, Tom Cruise, especially a guy that's all about like, you know, doing practical stunts, um, you know, all about, you know, sh you know, shooting on film, you know, very, the, the, the still the magic of movie making. Um, and now with things have gone now with movie making where it's all CGI, um, all, you know, computers doing most of the work when it comes to these effects, you know, it's like almost like a meta commentary on that of Tom Cruise facing off against this, you know, technology, this new age of, you know, this fighting this AI kind of system. So that's kind of the basic kind of setup here you have of in the AI in this movie uh, and Dead Reckoning it's called the entity um, is what is it is called here. Um, so I've been a big fan of the Mission Impossible series. Um, I think the Mission Impossible series um, has remained very consistent, especially ever since the third movie and on. Um, I think a lot of people can, you know, have really liked a lot of the entries of it from Mission Impossible, the third one from Ghost Protocol to Rogue Nation to Fallout, um, which typically it seems like the general consensus is that uh, Fallout is typically the best for some people, the best Mission Impossible movie. Would you all agree with that, that typically that's kind of the general consensus? Is there? For, yeah, I, I, would, I, I see would that agree all that the time. That's the consensus. Yeah. yeah, I, for me, I would, I would agree that it is the best. Uh, I think that four through six, you could really just pick any of those movies, and you're having a good time. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of in this movie, it's a, in Dead Reckoning, it's a mad race because you have all these countries um, where Ethan Hunt wants to destroy this AI. All these uh, you know countries want to control it because if they control it, they're going to be the top superpower. But all you need to control it is this key um, there to unlock it and to possibly have a chance at controlling it. Um, so it's kind of this Ethan Hunt versus everybody type of situation, all these kind of different countries, all racing to kind of get this key and, and, and to kind of control this entity, uh, that you see, um, some new additions to the cast. You have Haley Atwell in this, who plays uh, a thief in this, um, who is, is very, very good. I think in this movie, but we're going to get into uh, a lot of her character, um, later on, um, there, but, um, yeah, so I'm going to pass this, uh, around, get you guys thoughts on this, get, uh, see how you felt about it. So, Bradley, what are your thoughts on Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning? Well, I did just see this last night, and I'm still kind of two minds of it. I really like the idea of an AI villain that isn't a robot that longs to be like us. You know, I'm kind of tired of that trope. So not really knowing what the entity wants, just that it has everything and can do whatever it wants is kind of a very creepy thought. And rather than Ethan being like all the nations of the world going, well, I better make sure it's on my side. Of course he wants to do the right thing and just get rid of it because that kind of absolute power will destroy us all, et cetera, et cetera. I really like the new cast members in this and the returning cast members. Uh, Haley Atwell as a very skilled thief, but also not someone who wants to be shot at. I think that's a really good balancing act she she does in this film. And her slapstick and physical humor in this really caught me off guard because I've never seen her with any comedy chops, but her perfect timing and uh, just the being thrown around authentically. Of course, credit to any stunt double that she had, but it all flows very well and beautifully. And she fits right into this cast and this teamwork. Uh, love that the team is back. 
Luther and Benji are still a constant, and that's always a worry for me that we're going to get one of these movies and Luther will be off mission or somewhere else, you know, and we won't see him. And I'll be like, oh, that was my only critique of Ghost Protocol, that he's only in that film for like three minutes. And but paid cool seven million dollars for those three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and earned. Yeah, earned. He has such an amazing voice. Uh, and before I just rant about this forever, I also want to give a huge shout out to the best exposition actor in this film, Charles Parnell, explaining what the IMF is. Such a chef's kiss. And he did it brilliantly without making it sound ridiculous. I know that by movie seven, a lot of groups end up flandernizing themselves and kind of lose their mystique, like Dom and his family. Does anyone even care anymore? But uh, the way he explained the IMF, it's an absolute good, and I really enjoyed that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Nathan, what are some of your thoughts on Mission Impossible 7 here? I mean, it just it, it just works. I mean, it is, uh, it is another delightful entry in the franchise. I enjoyed how much it went against what you would expect after Fallout. It didn't try and up the ante as far as the self-seriousness. It it made a very knowing decision to go for more comedic. I mean, this is a movie about an AI versus a bunch of close-up magic spies. <laughs> and they make such an emphasis on the spy craft in this film. Um, I thought the stunt work was impeccable. I thought all the them all the new members of the cast are terrific. I thought the humor worked all throughout the movie. Um, the entity, once I heard AI was involved, and as the movie started to unfold, I got really trepidatious as to where it would go. But um, now that we are seeing this reality start to become more and more real. I like that it went from this Cold War idea of the end of the world in all the previous ones where it's usually somebody with a nuclear bomb and turns into a more, more realistic and more forward-thinking threat. This is the first Mission Impossible that has you think about the real world in a successful way. Um, and obviously so much of this is a, is a meta commentary on Tom Cruise's fight for analog in film that for uh movie stars versus cgi creations or you know movies being written by computers and he positions himself as the only hope for all of humanity like he normally does and he's also outside of this on a press tour positioning himself as mr movies who's gonna save the movies uh, and he makes a good case for himself, like like he did in Maverick, like he did in all the other ones. Um, it's still not as satisfying as previous entries in the franchise to me because of its uh, one part nature. But of all the part ones that I've seen this year, this was easily the most successful at ending while giving you a full meal and not leaving on an incomplete thought. Mm, interesting. But yeah, yeah, yeah uh, it's a big thumbs up for me. Now, I'm uh, going to get into a whole discussion about that a little bit later, too. The whole part one uh, trend of part ones that have kind of been going on, I guess, recently. Um, but, yeah, I mean, with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, uh, Tom Cruise again. I mean, he just kind of comes in and says everybody has to step aside. Flash, step aside. Fast X, step aside. Uh, Indiana Jones, step aside. Uh, let me show you how to do a good summer movie blockbuster like he did last year with Top Gun Maverick. Um, he's doing it again this year with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Um, and this movie is incredibly exciting as all the Mission Impossible movies are. Uh, as Bradley mentioned, you know, you know, you have something like Fast X and, and where I think you have something like the Fast and Furious series and you have something like the Mission Impossible series. And what separates those two? Um, even though they are both ridiculous and crazy in their own way and obviously implausible and all those things. It's like, what, what, you know, what's the difference between something like this and something like, you know, the Fast and Furious series? And I would say it is, you can feel the care that's put into it um, as opposed to something like Fast and Furious. And I think with Tom Cruise, who is all about, you know, doing these stunts, 
uh, which is a lot of the appeal to of these movies is that hey, this is Tom Cruise is crazy as fuck. You know what I mean? What what is his ass gonna do next? You know, what's he gonna <laughs> jump off next? What is he gonna hang on next? You know, you know, like he's just crazy as fuck. And to and uh, that's kind of also some of the appeal of these movies too is just like what crazy thing is he gonna do next? But also it's just you can feel the attention, the detail when it comes to you know the the filming of it, the practical nature of it. You know, which is just you can't beat in a lot of sense. You know, yes, I mean technology is great and CGI is great when you can use it and it you know obviously you know it has improved a lot of things in filmmaking um but there is that nature of when you see a guy when you see him you know jump off that cliff on the bike and then you know release the parachute and everything like that uh, which they train to do that for a whole year i think uh they they train to do that shot um so when you when you see that it is impressive and it, it, you know you do kind of have a lot of respect for that um and when it comes to the, a lot of the performances in here um because really i mean ethan hunt as a character is he really that had that much depth as a character not really um i think as a character he's just a simple guy that's like getting the job done you know he cares about his team he cares about humanity as you see throughout these movies uh that he's all about you know really making the right decision um when it comes to those things but you know when it comes to a lot of the i think the great chemistry between a lot of the people here like you you know bradley mentioned having simon Pegg back having vin rames back as benji and luther um, they work very well together. The new additions to the cast, like Haley Atwell, who's in this, who, who works in very well as this master thief and burglar. You also have a new addition to the uh, cast as uh, Palm Clemente, who people might know she's Mantis in the Guardians movies. Um, she kind of she really doesn't even really talk much in the movie. Um, she but her facial expressions are really great. Um, like the scene where she's driving like the big police truck. Um, I just want a compilation of just her face and, and that. Like, she's just having so much fun doing that. It's kind of this wacky, kind of crazy, kind of, you know, henchman role that she's in that works really well, um, that she's having a lot of fun. Uh, Elise uh, Morales, um, who's the villain in this, who's Gabriel, um, it is kind of, you know, he's very kind of monotone, but it's just he's got this cool nature to him of like, hey, I'm letting this, I'm, you know, because he's guided by the entity, this AI machine. He's the one that is this, you know, Gabriel, the archangel, you know, is working for this entity, which, you know, he looks at as like this god. And um, you see that, in his, you know, with his nature that, you know, he really fully believes in this thing and, and is willing to do whatever this thing says. Um, and is so kind of calm and, and, and menacing in a way. Um, and he kind of, I think, is more of a memorable Mission Impossible villain uh, than we've seen probably since because looking back at all these movies rewatching them all uh, all of them again because we are going to be doing a ranking of them uh, tomorrow um, probably one of the more memorable ones I've seen since probably the Philip Seymour Hoffman villain in the third one um, there so I thought he I, did uh, yeah go ahead I think the I think the thing that they cracked in this movie is that you really can't like you can't out movie star Tom Cruise. They tried that with Dugaray Scott in the second one. Like, he, and you can't out intensify him. You can try to go character actory against him, but nobody's going to top Philip Seymour Hoffman. Um, with this, making the villain an AI, an omnipotent force, you basically pit Tom Cruise against God, and he says so himself throughout it, where he, he yells at S.I. Morales, and he says, I will kill you and your God. And it is, it, it's, uh, it's the right height of villain to give this a real juice that the other films, even with uh, Solomon Lane, who's the villain in Rogue Nation and Fallout, I never found him to be as much of a threat as this. Mm, yeah. And then this is uh, a lot of really impressive uh, scenes here. Like I mentioned the scene that you see in the trailer, he jumps off the cliff in the bike and the parachute, but the car chase scene is, is really great here too. And, and uh, adds for some good comedic stuff here um, with him and the Haley Atwell. Um, I'm going to go around again. So what do you guys think of the action in this movie? As Nathan mentioned, you said that, you know, it's hard to top fall out and, you know, to, to kind of go big and keep getting bigger and bigger with all the action stuff. But how do you think the action was done here there, Bradley? I really enjoyed it. It's hard to say there was any kind of a set piece. And maybe this is because I'm just used to Tom Cruise not dying. But I didn't really get a sense of a set piece in this one that I would remember off the top of my head. Like right now, my favorite thing was the Fiat. And driving that all around with police chasing you, with a, a maniac, I'll just say it's a mercenary, trying to kill both of them, 
something's crashing through walls while another car has to move her around it. Like it was more of a technique of thrill than let's put actual lives in danger. And I'm sure these were very dangerous stunts. I'm not trying to say that. But uh, it definitely did a different take on the madness of it all. I'll never forget Tom Cruise hanging off the back of a plane as it's taking off. That's ingrained in my brain. As in, how is this guy? How does he sleep? What is his? What's in his blood? Like, who is this maniac? <laughs> but in this one, everything looked very controlled, and I think the purpose was more to entertain and to to have fun rather than we're trying to kill this old actor. So that's my take on that. I did enjoy every set piece. It, the cold open in this, the tension is so good. And I don't even know who these characters are. It's just a bunch of people on a submarine. And what comes of their conversation and their work, you know, we get a, we get a lot of information really quick on where they are, what they're doing, and how they need to stay alive. And I thought the tension right there was set at a certain level, and it never really drops below that. But before I, again, keep ranting about things, everything was so entertaining to watch and a lot of fun. And it's just nice to have fun for a couple hours, you know, just sit down and really enjoy something that you probably won't see for a long time until you watch these movies again. Hmm. Yeah. I, Nathan? I, yeah. I thought the stunts were as exhilarating as you would expect from a Mission Impossible movie. It's there are are hard it's hard to top fallout but it's also hard to top the dubai sequence the one set piece actually i would say there are three set pieces that really stood out to me um obviously the car chase as we were talking that that was a lot of fun that was just pure screwball comedy meets like you like your roger moore james bond movie sort of chase scene and then another set piece i absolutely enjoyed was uh the entire airport chase, which is more of just a, a chase between multiple different characters. Uh, we didn't bring up Shea Wiggum, who is constantly pursuing him and has a speech that almost rivals the uh, Alec Baldwin hunt as the living manifestation of destiny. Um, and it it's a lot of fun. There are a lot of things. Uh, there's a lot of great parallel action is what I really liked about this. You never got lost between what the characters were doing when there were a lot of characters on scene. And that mainly cumulate, uh, accumulates in the uh, train scene, which was my personal favorite set piece, where there are just multiple different levels that are constantly being established to you. There's, there's an objective, there's a clear goal. And then when everything goes out of whack um, and Tom Cruise is jumping from level to level of this train that is falling down, you get this, uh, get a new tension in every room. I thought it was fucking excellent. Um, the one thing that really keeps it from feeling as satisfying as your regular Mission Impossible set pieces, there's never a set piece where they are, they have the upper hand in any way, shape, or form. There's no outsmarting. You, you don't get that stuff. It's always... There's always a sense of melancholy, even when it's as funny as possible. Um, and the team never really gets a win, which, uh, you know, it, it's always one step forward, two steps back, which is fine. It just uh, it, it keeps it from feeling like the others, which might be a good thing. Yeah. So to circle back to Nathan's point before about this being a, a part one, um and then you know you know it's obviously part two well not obviously um because of the you know a, a sag uh, because of the writer strike actor strike there who knows when the the part two is going to be coming out it was supposed to be scheduled for next year but who knows how long that's going to be pushed back for um but do you all think that this feels like a you know a good chapter to close out and then it doesn't leave you with enough or do you think like you can't fully have an opinion on it until you see the second part because i know that recently there was you know cross the spider-verse that is a one that is a two-parter that's going to be broken up two parts with this and then beyond the spider-verse and um and and kind of some movies that have kind of been doing that recently like fast x did that like they're, they're going to do a, another two movies uh to complete the this whole story that they're going to wrap up with 
Um, so do you all feel like that you can't really like it feels kind of incomplete and you need the other part in order to fully judge this? Um, what what are kind of some of your thoughts there, Bradley, on that? I absolutely hate this trend. I was completely deflated by the sudden score jumping in after he says what he says. I won't spoil it, I suppose. And very annoyed. I feel like I should get to keep my ticket stub and they should pay me to finish the movie. Because I mean, I played for a full movie. Why are you giving me half a movie? And to not have a complete story after almost three hours, I'm so irritated by that. And I, I can admit it's kind of irrational thinking. I grew up in a time where cliffhangers were made so you kept watching. One of the most notorious cliffhangers ever is William Riker saying fire at a ship that his Captain Picard is on. And then it says to be continued. And then like six months later, we see the continuation of that. And it's William Riker going, no, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Don't fire. And feeling that cheated has made me bitter about <laughs> cliffhangers. And I'll probably be unreasonably and irrationally bitter about that until I pass away and I'm in the cold, cold ground. So, no, I hate it. I hate how this movie ended. Maybe in five years I'll, you know, warm up to it. It really depends on the next part, I suppose. But I'm a pretty petty person. So uh, what, what do you think, Nate? I... I mean, it's never going to be as satisfying as just getting a full movie. I've uh, I've made my peace with it, but it never felt like an incomplete meal or an incomplete thought, which uh, it's what Fast X felt like. It, we can just call that an incomplete meal. And then um, Across the Spider-Verse, to me, felt like an incomplete thought. This gave me a good idea of what's going to be in the next one without feeling like the movie just stopped. Um, it, it ended at a point where not knowing what's going to happen in the next film uh, at all, it felt like the logical point where you break the story in half. And perhaps this is a case of too much story for one film. I'm not sure that the movie even really required that much story, but uh so be it for me. Um, the, the people making these movies are smarter than I am. Uh, but no, I was I was satisfied, um, but not as satisfied as I am with other mission films. But mm. it, as far as like summer movies that are uh, part ones, this was uh, far and away the most satisfying of them. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I think that in order to you know, discuss all the Mission Impossible movies, you know, and if you're going to discuss all and um, you probably do need the other part if you're going to do that in order to probably judge all because it's not a full story yet to see how it ends because it could end terribly, could end shitty, could, you know, do something stupid at the end. Um, I don't think so. I mean, given the consistency of these movies, Christopher McCurry um, has done a good job uh, with these movies because uh, he he took on uh, during Fallout. Uh, he, he took on. No, he he took on oh. during Rogue Nation, but even more subtly, oh. he was brought on to rewrite Ghost Protocol. Uh, oh. He took on during uh, uh, Rogue Nation. Okay, so Rogue Nation was where he first started. So he took on there. Um, so he's he's being very consistent with these movies. So I, I have high hopes that they're going to finish it well. And then when comparing it to other part two, like what you know, other movies that are kind of breaking it up, and it's like, okay, we're going to finish the story later on, like Fast X. Um, I mean. I, I think this is better than something like that because Fast X, I mean, you ain't talking about shit. You know, wrap this shit up. You, you ain't really doing much. Um, with Across the Spider-Verse, um, I, I very much enjoyed Across the Spider-Verse. I thought, you know, I didn't have an issue with it being broken up. I thought, you know, it, you got a lot of story to tell here. I think you, 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 you know, you can, you can do that. Um, and this was, I didn't even notice that this Dead Reckoning was almost three hours. I didn't even, it was two hours and 49 minutes. Didn't even know that. I thought the time went by incredibly well. I thought the pacing was great. Um, so I didn't even notice the length on this movie. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I do think you'll get a lot of enjoyment out of it and then build up in anticipation for the next one. Um, depends, I guess, how you personally feel about that, about, you know, if you're somebody who's like Bradley, um, if you're that much of a curmudgeon about the part one, part two type thing, then uh, maybe you'll have an issue with it. But me, I'm not I'm not so much about that. It just depends on the movie. 
I think it depends on the movie, how much story you got, what are you doing, what are you talking about, uh, how much enjoyment I'm having out of this. Um, and I think that this provided enough good enjoyment, enough great moments in it that that worked really well, um, as it always does with the Mission Impossible series. Um, so I'm going to uh, go around. Give uh, you, you all can give your final thoughts, ratings. Um, again, just a reminder: the rating system. So we have the highest you can give something is this is cinema. Uh, then below that is peak. Um, then below that is a tune in. Uh, then our kind of other ratings that if you're feeling negative towards it, it would be tune out, skip it, burn it. Uh, a waste of fucking film is the absolute lowest uh, you can give something. Um, it's a waste of fucking film. So, uh, Bradley, final thoughts and rating for Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Well, you know, Tom Cruise is back and he does it again. Uh, just to push Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer next week, there's a quote from a character that uh, from The Prestige. He says, you never understood why we did this. The audience knows the truth. The world is simple, miserable, solid all the way through. But if you can fool them, even for a second, then you can make them wonder and you get to see something very special. You really don't know. It was the look on their faces. And I think this is what Tom Cruise is going for every single film that he'll ever be in for the rest of his life. And it shows in this film. This is not my favorite Mission Impossible movie. Mine's Rogue Nation. Uh, Fallout, a very close second. And just that stunt right there where he's on a bike and he stops on the cliff. Like, wow, that fooled me. That guy almost went off a cliff. That's crazy. Now, I have been kind of gushing over this. I do hate the stay tuned type of ending. I also hate the worst trope in this series that they kind of brought back. And it's Ethan Hunt can't protect his women. And I think that's silly. Like, really? <laughs> it's it's 2023. Why are we dragging that out again? That's like a 90s trope, isn't it? Why, why did this come back to the forefront? So I very much hated that. It's not the entirety of the story. And it's only a, what do you call it? The gloating of a villain that's trying to get under his skin. That's really pushing that kind of narrative. So I know it does have its purpose. Philip Seymour Hoffman, who is a brilliant as that psychopath also really leaned into that trope and I hated it then, but you know, he's a legend. So it's just a personal bias of mine from the films that I've seen this summer. I've been spoiled. The only other movie I've seen in a theater was across the spider verse. And that also was peak and it's sound and animation. The visuals here in a real world sense, just stunning. I love watching this guy do crazy set pieces, whether they be for humor, entertainment, or, wow, you don't see that crazy shit every day type of filmmaking. I love the family of Luther, Benji, Ethan, and is it Elsa as well, who joins the cast again? It's uh, yep. Rebecca Ferguson, one of my favorite Mission Impossible characters. So I am actually going to, you know, set aside being a cynic and say this is peak summer filmmaking, and you should see it on the biggest screen possible as him and his compatriots would say, promoting the film. Yeah. Nathan. Uh, I mean, <coughs> it's, uh, it, it's just a fucking fun time at the movies. It, it is, it, it is an absolute blast. Um, it, it, it's delivering what these movies have dependably been delivering, which is just high octane action. Great character moments there i mean mccory's gift for expressing character through action is great with every single character in this movie um i just uh I, I love this franchise this is our best our best franchise out there right now um tom cruise has just continued this freaking winning streak that he's been on as of lately and yeah you should see it i this is uh right between peak cinema and uh what, what is it? Uh, or this is cinema, and then uh, peak. I'll, I'll yep. call it peak cinema. Mm. Let, let peak cinema. We'll go for in between. Okay. Which actually yeah. sounds like a higher order, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
Yeah, so with Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, um, I very much greatly enjoyed this movie. Uh, this is, uh, you know, as Bradley said, this is very much peak, you know, summer blockbuster movie making here. Um, and, you know, I'm not like Bradley. I have to see a lot of other movies like Indiana Jones and The Flash and all this other stuff. So I saw how weak that this can be. And, um, yeah, I mean, this is very much, I mean, Tom Cruise does it again. I mean, like he did with Top Gun Maverick. Um, do I think it's as good as something like Top Gun Maverick? No, I don't. Uh, but I still think it is a very much enjoyable time. Uh, when it comes to, you know, some of the negatives of this movie, Bradley mentioned a good point about, you know, the whole, like, you know, what is he going to do? You know, how can he protect the, the women in his life? You know, sometimes, I mean, that is a common theme in the Mission Impossible movies, not just the women in his life of, you know, can he protect them? But um, also, but just in general, it's just the team. You know, you know, can I protect my team? You know, the, even in Fallout, the whole thing was, you know, uh, he let Vin Rames character live. And so because of that decision, you know, that it, it is like, what are the huge ramifications from that? You know what I mean? Can he do both? Um, and, and so some of that does come back in here, but there's also a little bit of a more of a focus on the women in his life. Um, that that's something when it. You know, uh, so I thought that was a little bit of a, of a weakness of the movie there. Uh, but overall, I mean, this is a strong movie um, on all the elements um, when it comes to the action, when it comes to the characters here, uh, when it comes to just the fun joyride that this movie is. Um, I think you'll have a great time in the theaters watching it. Um, and I think it is a movie that you probably want, want to see on the big screen, on the IMAX, on, you know what I mean, the biggest screen possible that you can kind of see it on to get more of a kind of an effect on that. Um, and I think you will greatly enjoy it. Um, do I think this is my favorite Mission Impossible movie? I don't know. Maybe if I see a part two, maybe it could be. Uh, right now, for me, that's still Fallout. It's still my favorite Mission Impossible film right now. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm going to agree uh, with uh, these two guys. I'm going to give it peak um, uh, for Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning. Um, yeah, yeah. 